The book is a tool. In our culture, experts have books, and it carries a lot of credibility because of the level of challenge it is to actually create a book. It's different than saying, I'm gonna post on LinkedIn. Who cares? Everybody can do that, right? There's no credibility there. But when you can influence how people think about you, just like Richard talked about, when you put a book in somebody's hand, a, it changes how they think about you. B, they're never going to throw it away. It is sacrilegious to throw a book away. And if you want to get referrals or if you have a podcast and you are trying to get somebody on your podcast, how about mailing them a copy of your book and then following up and say, hey, Richard, did you get the big FedEx package I sent you? Yeah, I'm the guy who sent that to you. I'd love to interview you on my podcast. Do you think they're going to say no? are an inspiring group of people. Every one of them from the larger than life comic book heroes you see on the big silver screen, the everyday heroes that let us live the privileged lives we do. Every hero has a story to tell. From the doctor saving lives at your local hospital, to the war veteran down the street who risked his life for our freedom, to the police officers and the firefighters who risk their safety to ensure ours. Every hero is special and every story worth telling. But there is one class of heroes that I think is often ignored. The entrepreneur, the creator, the producer, the ones who look at the problems in this world and think to themselves, you know what? I can fix that. I can help people. I can make a difference. Then they go out and do exactly that by creating a new product or introducing a new service. Some go on to change the world. Others make a world of difference to their customers. Welcome to The Hero Show. Join us as we pull back the masks on the world's finest heropreneurs and learn the secrets to their powers, their success, and their influence. So you can use those secrets to attract more sales, make more money, and experience more freedom in your business. I'm your host, Richard Matthews, and we are on in three, two, one. Hello and welcome back to The Hero Show. My name is Richard Matthews, and today I have live on the line Michael DeLon. Michael, are you there? I am here, Richard. Thanks for having me, sir. Awesome. So glad to have you here. So where's home? Where are you calling in from? I am in Little Rock, Arkansas. So it's probably warmer there than here. My audience knows I travel full time, and they'll probably notice I'm wearing a jacket inside today because it decided it was going to be 27 degrees outside in the middle of springtime. 27. So, that's that's yeah. like f almost. No, that's freezing. I was going to say that's freezing, but that is several freezing. degrees below freezing. But I'm a desert baby, so my blood freezes at 65 degrees. So we're working on 40 degrees below freezing here. I'm basically <laughs> a popsicle. I love it. Yeah, we're a balmy 55, sunny spring weather. It's really nice out here today. Yeah, that's what I want to do. I've got. We're going to go visit some friends in Alabama in a couple of weeks. So I'm excited to get down there, get down to the warm weather. So what I want to do before we get too far into the interview is I always like to start and do a brief introduction of who you are so my audience knows who you are, and then we'll tie, dive in and start talking about your story. So Michael DeLon creates credibility as America's credibility coach and president of Paperback Experts. He helps business owners clarify their message and capture more clients using their Amazon best-selling book. By implementing its credibility marketing system, you'll gain more clients, get more referrals, and grow your revenue. So what I want to start the interview off with, Michael, is what you're known for. This question sets up who you are, what your business is like, who you serve, and what you do for them. Wow, that's crazy. What am I known for is seriously helping experts become a best-selling author to, to differentiate them in the marketplace. At the end of the day, we've cut our teeth over the last few years really around credibility. And a lot of people aren't sure what that is. So we talk with them about that and how marketing happens in the mind and how do you influence the mind. So I think if anything, that's really what we've become known for is, is how to get your book done quick and easy and fast and build credibility with your audience. Yeah, it's very similar to what we talk about with our podcast company that uh, you're building. I call it the no like and trust in the marketplace or thought leadership. I, I'm just curious before we even get into the interview, one of the things I've been telling every person we talk to in sales or pre-sales and when we speak on stage is that today, if you want to get a lead or even better, a sale, you have to build the no like and trust before they even become a lead. Right. Because we're no longer live in the information age. Right. The information age was killed by YouTube and TikTok. We live in what I call now the trust age. Right. So you have yeah. to build that trust before they'll even consider entering your sales funnel in any way. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right, because people aren't looking for information anymore because they can find that on Google and every place else. They're looking for a, a trusted expert who will help guide them to whatever they're going for. And trust is huge. That's why podcasting is so important. That's why books are so important. It builds that level of confidence in the person. And that's another word of saying no like and trust. Yeah, no like and trust. There's a lot of words for it nowadays, thought leadership, and it's that's such an important part of being able to sell today. And it, it doesn't really matter what type of business you're in either. You don't have to be a great salesperson if you've done a great job preconditioning, building trust and in lowering the barriers. It makes selling so much easier. Yeah, yeah. I can back that up. I just had a, a sales call earlier today where the other 
party. They already knew who we were. They've already knew all of our processes. They knew what our pricing was. They just knew all everything we were doing and they have had experience with past clients. So they had already got all of the thought leadership and trust and everything at the beginning. So the sales call was basically just like, can you just give us the details and answer them the questions we couldn't find elsewhere, right? So they just like, it, it's lay down sales kind of thing. They're like, no, we're already ready to buy. Just we've got a couple of details we need to know the answers for. 100%. It, it puts you very much in the position of, of being more of a concierge than a salesperson or, or whatever. It's like, yes, I can take care of that. Yes, answer the questions. It's a lot more fun for both parties because it's a relationship that we have. It's not a transaction. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's crazy too, because as we build more of that credibility in the marketplace for ourselves, and we see our clients do the same thing, and I'm sure you see the same thing happen, the level of clients that you attract goes up. Oh, the absolutely. ease of the sales, the sales process goes up. It compounds and makes everything in your business better if you start by building that credibility and trust factor at the beginning. Right? So the, the client we were talking to today is a billion dollar company. They're yeah. huge. And they come to us with, hey, we're already ready to go. Yeah. Okay. And that's how we want it to be. And it's all about how do you approach it from the very beginning. And yeah. you approach business very much like I do is, is we're an open book, right? We give people the programs, the pricing, the process, all of that before we ever talk with them so that we can have a great conversation and go, is this the right next step for you? And if it's not, we'll tell them. We've had yeah. prospects that we say, no, this really isn't the best next step. We should go this direction first. So it's that's okay. actually a really good question with book marketing. I know book marketing, it's not a cheap proposition by any means. It's a high end. And I would probably put it in like middle or late stage, like business growth, where you're looking at stuff. Where do you actually see book marketing fitting into a company? So I know, for instance, for us, when we talk to companies about podcasting, we're generally saying, hey, if you don't know what your offer is yet, if you don't know what your place in the marketplace is yet, you're probably too early to start a podcast. And I'm curious where that fits in with book marketing. Is it similar? Is it different? No, I'd say it's very similar. I, I really like to see somebody having been in business a minimum of three years before they come and create a book with us because they need some street cred. They need to make sure they have enough confidence and some success stories behind them. But they don't have to be in business 20 years, right? You've got enough, but it's usually not the first thing out of the gate that somebody's going to do. Yeah. It's one of those things like people talk regularly about like, oh, I'm going to start a business. What's the first thing I need to do? I need to get like a business card and a website. And I'm like, no, what you really need is an offer that the market wants to buy. And you get that and then you can yeah. move on. And it's like, after you have your offer, then you can start talking about like, how are we going to market that offer and putting in there? And that's where things like book marketing or podcast or direct response marketing is going to fit in. So it's yeah. like second or third stage kind of thing. Let's get some money in the bank and some sales going to know that your offer actually works. Then we'll decide what channels are right. Channels being media, podcasting, or book, or TikTok, or whatever it is. Those all come later. You're right. It's the offer. It's the message. Is the audience even responding to it? Let's get some money in the bank first. Yeah. So that was just building off of that question. Hey, who are the right types of customers for this? And if you're actually putting in the content in the marketplace, the customers or the leads will know when it's a good time to reach out. And they're like, okay, I've reached that stage. I know now. I know when I should reach out to you guys. And that makes that whole sales process a lot simpler. Well, it really does. Yeah. And we have a great sales, a, a pre-sales process. I'm sure you do as well. That in a sense disqualifies people. And if you're not ready for this, it's okay. Just cancel the call and do these things first. Let's wait because we want people to be educated and realize it might be a year or two before they're really ready. But I'd rather them do that. I, I never want somebody, Richard, to come and buy a book for me and do stuff and put themselves upside down in the business because they really weren't ready. That would be the worst thing for all of us. And so, yeah, having the right prospect at the right time, it makes all the difference in the world. Then it really works and everybody's happy. Yeah, yeah. And what's interesting is having a book will help you get your clients into the right place at the right time. Isn't it fun how it just all works yeah. together? It, all yeah. it works together that way. So here's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about your origin story. It's something we talk about on, with every person that comes on this show. Every good comic book hero has an origin story. It's the thing that made them into the hero they are today. And we want to hear that story. Were you born a hero or were you bit by a radioactive spider that made you want to get into the publishing business? Or did you start in a job and eventually become an entrepreneur? Basically, we want to know where you came from. Yeah, that's great. I'll try to make it short because it, it really goes, it, it spans a lot of my life. But the real origin story as I look back at my life happened on June 29th of 1987. And that was the day that my dad was killed in a motorcycle accident. And when I drove home that night and I was on my motorcycle, I parked in the garage. I walked in and on the kitchen table, Richard, was a note that my dad had written to me. He said, Mike, I'm up to the lake to see mom. Your mom will be home at 10 o'clock. See you later, dad. 
And that note hangs in my closet today, Richard. If my house burns down, it's the only thing I'm going to go get, right? Because of that note, though, I write letters to my wife and my children on birthdays and anniversaries and Father's Day because the written word is all I have left of my dad. And none of my family were around when he died. Look at what I do now. I help people write words, right? So I think that was the original part. But let's fast forward a little bit. 1990, I married my wife, Jill. And we started down that road of of marital bliss, right? First five years of our marriage were like this. We were complete opposites. So we, we fought and had a lot of conflict. We both grew up in church, but nobody taught us how to be married. And so we went to a a weekend to remember family life marriage conference in Indianapolis with a thousand other people. And they impact God's blueprints for marriage. I didn't know God had blueprints for marriage. So we grabbed his blueprints. We applied them. Our marriage got better in the 90s. We had two sons during that time. I was in Christian radio. Realized nobody wants to buy Christian radio, Richard. They want to sell their products and services. So I had to learn marketing for small business owners. So I did. My business grew. End of the 90s, God led us out of Christian Radio to a startup.com. Do you remember when Amazon just got started and uh, William Shatner was on the radio? Right? World's largest bookstore. I was selling websites and banner ads to hospitals and car dealers who didn't even have anything. That company was ahead of its time, which means they went bankrupt. So I found myself standing in my house going, God, what am I supposed to do now? He said, I want you in a ministry to marriages and I want you at family life. That ministry that changed our marriage. So we raised our support for two years as missionaries moved from Indiana down to Little Rock, Arkansas, and joined Family Life. Thought I hit nirvana. Why would I ever do anything else, Richard, but help other people have strong, godly marriages? So I served at the ministry, and I climbed the corporate ladder. And six years later, I'm on the leadership team of this international ministry to marriages. And then they start going through corporate reorganization. So the third reorganizational chart gets rolled out and my name's no longer on the leadership team. So they start shuffling me around the ministry to do different things. And that began, Richard, a two-year, I call it a prison term, because I was in a job I hated at a ministry I loved. And so after two years, I got fed up. I talked to my wife. I prayed to God. I said, I got to get out of this place. And, and, and God said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to go help business owners with marketing because they hate it and they struggle with it, but I love it. And he said, go. So on January 1st of 2013, Richard, I escaped from prison. And I left the ministry and I started a marketing consulting firm. I had one client. I helped him break through some barriers. He'd refer me to you. And I'd come and talk with you about your business and how I could help you grow your business. And you'd say, Michael, sounds great. What have you done in the last few years? Who else have you helped? And I said, Richard, I've helped build marriages and families at Family Life. And you'd say, Michael, that's honorable. Way to go. Oh, look at the time. I've got another appointment coming in. Let's reschedule and keep this conversation going. And um, and you'd usher me out the door. And I wasn't gaining any clients. So I knew I had to fix that. So I went to my church one day and I paced the hallways back and forth. And I said, God, how do I help Richard? Because I know I can. And he just spoke to my heart. He said, take all of your ideas around marketing, all of your strategies and put them in a book. So I took the time and I, I wrote my first book called On Marketing. And then I would call you, Richard. I'd send an appointment. I'd mail a copy of my book to you. I'd walk in your office a week later and there it was. My book was on your desk. Dog-eared, highlighted, underlined. You'd read my book. And in that meeting, you'd pick up my book and you'd say, Michael, in your book, you said, how do you help me do that? And you hired me. And I started gaining clients and I went, this is really a great marketing strategy. Why don't business owners do this? Richard, it's challenging to write a book. There's just a lot to it. So I just yeah. built a system to eliminate all the barriers where today I help experts and business owners create a book without writing a word. And I teach them how to use their book to gain clients. And that's how I got here. That is my story, man. It's been so oh. much fun. My favorite thing about your story is that you know all the dates. That just makes me happy because I'm a nerd that way and I know all of my dates too, but not very many people do. Uh, I was like, mine is like August 7th, 2007 is when I dropped out of college. I was going to Bible college actually and learning to be a preacher because I was like, you know, I'm done. I got what I needed from here and I'm going to go start my business. And the other thing that I really like about your story is the idea where you were talking and you're like, hey, again, God just asked, what do you want to do? And then you go do that. And that's one of the things yeah. that I've always, as with the ministry background that I have, I've always hated the very common mentality in the church, really. We're waiting for God to beam down to you like, Scotty, here <laughs> is your mission. Go and follow these things. And the reality yeah. is he wrote your code, right? Like it's in there. Totally. The things that you were designed to do, that's what he wants you to go do. Like go do those that's things cool. that make you come alive. That's right. Exactly. Because, yeah, he gets more glory that way. I have a whole lot more fun that way. And everybody else benefits. Absolutely. And you don't and you don't have to wait. Right. You can find the things that make you come alive. And that's where your mission comes from. So I love both of those things. And 
I wanted to re- just share a quick story just to help prop up how important a book can be to you. So mm-hmm. my first book that I wrote was called, it was Why Your Website is Annoying the Hell Out of Your Visitors, 35 Profit-Killing Mistakes Your Business is Making. And I wrote that book to get a very specific job. So I was running a, a marketing agency and I realized that I was actually not very good at running a marketing agency. Not because I wasn't good at marketing. I wasn't good as a business owner. Like I yes. sucked. And that was way back in 2012. And I was like, I, I know how to solve this. What I need to do is I need to go and just sit under the tutelage of people who know how to run a business. And so I need to get like a C-level position where I'm sitting together every single week with a C-level team and a board of directors and like a CEO who knows how to run a successful company. So I can learn all of those things while I do what I do best, which is marketing. And so I was like, I shut down my business and I was like, I'm going to write a book and get a job as a C-level marketing director. And so... Me and one of my best friends were actually going to visit them this week. That's why we're freezing our butts off in Iowa, because we co-wrote this book together over a course of 24 hours. And we did probably followed your exact strategy without even knowing it. And we wrote this whole book. And I took a copy of that book. And I went through this company that I wanted to get a job with. And I was like, I needed a a company that was close. I needed to have a $25,000 a month marketing budget. And I wanted to be at least 100 seats and butts at the company. So I had a big enough company to like really test my skills with. And then I could learn from like the upper leadership that's running a company that size because I wanted to be that big someday. So I wanted to know. And I wrote that book. And then I took everything that was publicly available for that company. And I wrote little post-it notes and I put them in each chapter. And I just printed like one copy from Amazon and I sent it to myself. (laughs) I love it. And I took in each chapter, I put a little handwritten note that went along with things that I could find publicly about the company. And they had this position open for the director of marketing, like this, you know, C-level position that was on the C-suite. I'm like 24 at the time. And I don't have any of the credentials that they want for this position. They're like, you need to have this degree. You need to have this many years of experience. You need to have all these things and run a team. And I was like, I know, just like anyone else knows in the world of marketing, businesses don't hire because of credentials. They hire because you can solve the problem that they have. And Absolutely. I knew that if I went through HR, I would get filtered out because I didn't check any of the things. That all HR is for is just to, is to filter out the people that aren't going to be a good fit. And so I needed exactly. to get around that. And I used a book to do it. And so I took the book and I put it in a FedEx package. I went and yeah. bought one of those boxes and stuck it in the FedEx package. And I went into the company's office and I put for your eyes only and put the name of the, the, the president of the company on it. And I stuck it on his desk. <laughs> I made the front desk person sign for it. Long story short on that, I closed a six and a half figure per year position with a $25,000 a month marketing budget, work from home hours and more. We 10 x their business over the next 18 months. And I beat out 256 other applicants, all of whom had all the qualifications and I did not. And I was the one who got the position because of the book. So that one book, 24 hours, 48 hours to write the book and a couple of days to get it printed from Amazon and sent to me was a six and a half figure per year position. We can tell story after story of very similar things. It's amazing because of how, what a book does in the mind of your audience. When they got that book, when that president opened that book, everything changed about Richard. Who is this guy? What's he done? And as he opened and saw the sticky notes, he's like, we need to talk to this guy. The rest is history. Yeah. I talked to the president of the company afterwards over the course of, the, I tootled under him for two years. He was like, I got that book and started going through your stuff. I was, he read it on an airplane ride between the couple of the offices. And he was like, you were hired at that point. And there's a whole story that goes along with the hiring process. But he was like, I still had to go through like the legal channels to hire you. But he was wow. like, I didn't care about any other applicants anymore. You were the only person I was going to hire. And that's what a book does, not just to get a job, but in business and marketing, going back to what we talked about earlier of pre-educating people, all of that. I, I talked to one of my clients today. He's like, man, I want to use my book to get on stages to speak. I said, great, Kevin, here's what you do. And I walk him through a very similar process. Mail your book, right? Connect on LinkedIn. Do some basic things. But how, how are you going to use this tool? It's so much fun. Yeah, and then, I, I think one of the things that might be for people who think book, the baggage that comes with the word book is fiction authors who are trying to get on the New York Times bestseller list. Oh. And while that is perfectly legitimate baggage to have because of the way the book industry works, it's not what you're talking about here. So if you can talk just for a few minutes, the difference between being a fiction writer who's trying to get published and on the New York Times versus a business owner who's using a book as a marketing tool for their company. Yeah. If you're writing fiction to be like Stephen King or something, more power to you, go. Don't ever call me because I don't know a thing about that. That's a whole different world. If you're a business owner and you want to grow your business, let's have a conversation. Because what we talk about, I mean, yeah, the book is a tool. In our culture, experts have books, and it carries a lot of credibility because of the level of um, challenge it is to actually create a book. It's different than saying, I'm going to post on LinkedIn. Who cares? Everybody can do that, right? There's no credibility there. 
But when you can influence how people think about you, just like Richard talked about, when you put a book in somebody's hand, A, it changes how they think about you. B, they're never going to throw it away. It is sacrilegious to throw a book away. And if you want to get referrals or if you have a podcast and you are trying to get somebody on your podcast, how about mailing them a copy of your book and then following up and say, hey, Richard, you get the big FedEx package I sent you? Yeah, I'm the guy who sent that to you. I'd love to interview you on my podcast. Do you think they're going to say no? So it's all about ROI, return on investment. How do you get a return on investment and how do you create an asset, a marketing asset that has shelf life? You create a yeah. book, you invest yeah. in it one time, it's there for the rest of your career. It is yeah. amazing. There's so many ways to use a book in your marketing to grow your business. We could be here all day talking about that. Yeah, yeah. And the, the people never throw books away, right? You get a business card from someone, you might put their information in your phone and then toss the business card. You give someone a book, it's going to sit on their bookshelf for 20 years. That's right. right. Pass it's, it on to their children. <laughs> that's right. No, it's terrible. We're getting removed from Little Rockton, Lexington. And man, I'm just packing up all my books. And it's like, oh, should I take this one? Uh, and I'm donating books. I'm giving books to people. I'm not throwing them away. Yeah, you don't throw books away. You donate them you to the local library, right? Someone's going to get value out of that book, even if the person you gave it to originally doesn't keep it. A hundred percent. And guess what? Somebody else is going to pick that up and go, wow, that's pretty cool. So, Yeah, I love that. And the other thing that I just wanted to draw attention to for people is the book itself, it serves so many purposes, right? There's the expert authority that comes from being a, a writer. There's the actual content inside the book that you can drive people into your sales funnel. Oh, yeah. There's the business card aspect of it. If like your name is sitting on their shelf, like in their house, there's just a lot of wins there. And to your point about the amount of work that goes into building a book, there's been a lot of research done that shows that consumers in particular, and it doesn't matter if it's B2B or B2C, consumers of, of any type, they place a higher value on things that they perceive to be more difficult. And it yes. doesn't matter if the difficulty is true, if the perception of difficulty is there, the value is automatically increased. And so you mentioned, for instance, posting on LinkedIn, right? Posting on LinkedIn yeah. is not perceived high value, but you know what it is? Someone who posts on LinkedIn every day for three years, yes. right? Because that consistency is perceived difficulty. And so like we talk about that on the podcast where it's like anyone can put out a podcast, right? Anyone can put out, and, and you know what it is? 97% of podcasts don't make it past their 10th episode. It's so sad. I've seen this happen in our own podcast, and you've probably seen this too, right? Because you're up at over, your podcast has got like 300 plus episodes. Our podcast yeah. got like 150. We got past 100 episodes on our podcast. People are beating down our door to come be guests. Oh yeah, right? totally. Uh, and it's because there's that perceived authority that comes with the difficulty of being consistent over time, right? Yes. And so the books have that same type of perceived difficulty. And right? it's not easy to write a book. So if you have a book, there's value there. Yes. Oh, without question. And then the fun part for me is because remember back in my Christian radio days, learning about marketing. So I'm a book publisher, but I'm a marketing centric book publisher. I know what to do with your book to help you gain, get clients because a lot of my clientele want to have the authority, the credibility. We publish their book, make them best selling authors and they go, what do I do with this? And so then we teach them all these marketing strategies that are super simple to gain clients, get them in your funnel, hand them out, let your clients give them to your friends. There's so many ways to use your book in your marketing, whether you're attracting, engaging, retaining, referring, doesn't matter. A book is like your utility player on your team. Yeah, it's funny. You and I were just talking before we got on this podcast that I run a podcasting company and probably the next thing that we need to do for our company is get a book written about our process for podcasting. <laughs> Seriously, because it's so easy and you gain so many clients when you just put it into a codified form. Wow. That's cool. But you're the expert. You're the guy who wrote the book on it's how the mind thinks. Yeah. So one of the things we talk to people about with their podcasts is we talk about you should do a series. We call it the Ten Commandments of insert whatever your expert area of expertise right. is. And the reason we do we tell them to make a series like that on their podcast is that if you're the one who writes the rules, then you get the authority that goes along with being the rule writer. And so it's right. the same kind of thing. You wrote the book on podcasting or you have the Ten Commandments of podcasting. Like these guys are the ones who wrote the rules. Obviously, they're the experts. Absolutely. <laughs> and hopefully, yourself. hopefully you're writing the rules. So most of those rules lean back into you. One, one of our clients early on, he's an auto repair shop. And we told him, we said, okay, in one of the chapters, we want you to say, here are the five questions to ask any mechanic before he ever touches your car. And he was the only shop in town that could answer yes to all five questions, right? And yeah. it's positioning that way because he's writing the rules, just like you said, brilliant strategy that nobody really picks up on. 
but now they're they're pitting you against everybody else. All your competitors are going, well, gosh, he he said this, and they're not doing that. And oh well, we better go with them. Of course, yeah. you should go with them. So, so I, what I want to talk about then is I want to talk a little bit about your superpowers in this book publishing world, right? Every iconic mm-hmm. hero has a superpower, whether that's a fancy flying suit made by their genius intellect or the super strength, um, or the ability to call down thunder from the sky. In the real world, heroes have what I call a zone of genius, which is either a mm-hmm. skill or a set of skills that you were born with or that you have developed over time that energize all your other skills. And the superpower is what sets you apart. It allows you to help your people slay their villains, come out on top of their own journeys. And the way I like to frame it for my guests is you probably have a skill that, you know, over the course of your career, you've developed all of these skills. There's probably one that's sort of like a common thread that ties them all together. And so with that framing, what do you think your superpower is in this book publishing world? Yeah, without question, and I don't know which super superhero might have it, but it's, it's X-ray vision. In Superman that, has that, Superman had that. There he you does. go. I'll take X-ray vision. I don't have all the other stuff that Superman had, but X-ray vision. In that, I can. I have this unique ability, Richard, to talk with a, a client, to get their their backstory, and to craft and create a very compelling message that becomes the title and theme for their book, but also becomes the cornerstone for their marketing going forward. What what I find is a lot of business owners just have a bland message. I'm a personal injury attorney. I'm a financial advisor. I'm a, you're Charlie Brown's teacher. I'm a podcast right? agency, right? Whatever it is. Yeah. Okay, great. Let me get your story and I will create a message that sets you apart like nobody's business. And yeah. now we're on to something, a big idea that's, that, that helps you gain clients. That's yeah, absolutely. my ability. That, that's a brilliant ability. It's something I wish I had. I, am, I, mm. I have stumbled onto a couple of those things occasionally, like the name for our business, Push Button Podcasts, I think nails on our message pretty well. But yep. like that happens occasionally for me. But for, to run into people that have that ability to just to distill what you do into very brief, easy to understand, easy to digest, and gets your benefit across to someone else, that is such a potent skill. And I can't remember who said it. There's a famous philosopher that talks about, you know, b- about how powerful brevity is. And it's like, if you can t- say the same thing in a hundred words and three words, right? The three words will be more powerful. I'm the hundred word kind of guy. I will say that I will say what you, what someone else could say in three words and 400 words. And like that, you know, that's where I'm at. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, I get it. I so, get it. It's, a, it's a lot like poetry, right? When you think about poetry, it's not about rhyming words. It's about helping people gain a new perspective using an economy of words. Yeah. That's what poetry is all about. And, and that's what we get to do in, in creating messages and then allowing our client to elaborate more through their book and, and through podcasting and everything else that they can do. So. Yeah, yeah, because what you, you have to get, that's, that's the whole, you know, people judge a book by its cover, right? I know the saying is people don't, don't judge a book by its cover, but the reality is everyone judges a book by a cover. If you, if, if you have your title on the book and they don't want to read the subtitle, you're done, right? That's right. <laughs> if that's you read right. the subtitle and they don't want to flip the book over and read the paragraph on the back, you're done, right? Yeah. And so you have to be able to get distill the message across so that yes. someone wants to read the rest of what you have to say. Without question. Yeah. And then when it's done right, you take that core message and you create a podcast with that same message on it. And now you can elaborate even more. And then your LinkedIn post, your Facebook post, your whatever, it's all tied around this one central message. I mean, very, very similar. I mean, probably the most recent guy who did it, Simon Sinek, when he did his yeah. TEDx talk right on start with why. Okay. Now, the guy was brilliant. He, he got a video to go viral. That was awesome. But then he wrote a book. And then he got invited to speak for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Then he's got a podcast. Now he's got a second book. And, but it was that one core message, start with why, that just everybody resonated with to tell me more. As a business owner, you you have a story like that can that can be distilled, but you've got to find it and then use it. And it's powerful because then everywhere you go, whatever media you're using, people come back to that. And none of your competitors have that, trust me. Yeah. And that's one of the things like we, we talk about that all the time with our clients, too, is like, like you know, we're, we're generally talking about 
podcasts with people and they're like, I have to produce a podcast every week for eternity. I don't have that many things to say. Right. And I'm like, what I generally respond with is you don't have to have that many things to say. You have to have one thing to say that you're willing to talk about over and over and over and over and over again in as many different permutations as possible until it hits with the person that is ready to buy. Right. That's right. Um, Yeah. You you have one message and you tell it in a thousand different ways. That's all it is. And it never gets boring to your audience. And it shouldn't get boring to you. I can talk about my stuff all day long. But how long has Walmart had the save money live better? Right. A really long time. <laughs> yeah. Like since I was a child, it's like 30 plus yeah. years. Right. That's it's right. the same message. That's and they they've been putting out marketing every single week for you know many, many decades on one That's message. Right. Save money, live better. Right. That's Whether right. or not you agree with that for what they do, it doesn't matter. Like they, one message. <laughs> That's right. And that one message sets you apart. Because again, your competitors don't have a message. They have a bland message and you need a sharp message. So that is, yeah, that's probably my superpower, whether it's, whether you call that x-ray vision or what we would call it, but to see inside of you and pull it out of you and go, here it is, and be able to craft it in an economy of words. That's what I do. So listen, I've been doing marketing for, you know, 20 years now. If you don't have someone in your life that can help you do that, call Michael. That's a Absolutely. superpower like no other. So. Yeah, thank you. And it oh. jazzes me. The other thing, I did it twice this week for different clients. And I I called my son, who's my chief operating officer. I said, Caleb, I just did it the second time. I said, if I could do that all day, I would be so jazzed, right? And that's yeah. how I know it's my superpower because it gives me energy. So Yeah, that's one of the uh, things we talk about a lot as my company has started to grow, realizing that like, hey, I have to, I have to protect my energy at all costs and then figure out what are the things that give me energy and what are the things that suck my energy, right? 100%. And, you know, I found recently it was like, hey, I don't mind doing sales, but sales is an energy suck for me. It is. Right? So I have to get someone for whom it is an energy giver to do that yeah. work. And so that's what that's why I've, I've started building that sort of like philosophy into our hiring processes. It's like, hey, we're going to hire you to do this thing. Does this thing make you get up and like salivate with joy? Right. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> um, no, if totally. It <laughs> yeah. if you're going to be, un- yeah, you're going to be unhappy. And we're going to be unhappy. And this is not a good fit. Tell me now. Yeah. No, 100%. Yeah. You build those, Dan Solomon, I'm in strategic coach, and Dan Solomon talks about building a unique ability team. Build a team, you have a unique ability, build a team around you, which each person is in their unique ability. And he's like, I never have to manage anybody. I just give them the project because I know they're great at it, and they go do it, and they figure out how to make it work. I don't, I don't have to worry about it. I'm like, yeah, very much what you're doing, just different words. Yeah, my thing, and this is where I've, I'm still trying to figure out how to do this in my company, because, you know, as an entrepreneur, you have to wear a lot of hats until you can yes. get other people to wear those hats. And yeah. getting to that point in my company where I'm realizing, like, okay, these are the hats that when I put them on, like, I'm excited to get up every day and do these things. Yes. And and so, like, I'm starting to figure that out in my company, like, where do I need to be? And then how do I spend most of my time doing that? I call, I call it highest and best use, right? How is yep. it that, like, my highest and best use and how do I make sure my team has their highest and best use? And anyways, that goes right into knowing your superpowers and then knowing your team superpowers and then really building your company around having your yeah. you and your team operating from a point of their, you know, where they're the greatest. Oh, without question. Yeah. And and that's, you know, I mentioned my son, Caleb, our, our phrase around our company is everybody needs a Caleb. And so if, if Caleb, if Caleb were here, if he had a business card, his uh, title or, or his little thing underneath his name would be, I make Michael's business dreams come true. So Caleb and I are opposites on the Colby process, you know, the the personality thing. And it's really good because I'm the big idea guy. I'm out front. Caleb, and I'm a fast start, man. I get an idea. I'm ready to go. Caleb is the researcher and he gets everything in place. He's, he builds all the systems. We are a great team and we've learned that, right? And we're opposites, not like oil and water. We're opposites like a hand in a glove. We work so well together, but our team, our, our business has grown and our team has expanded because I know what I'm great at. So does he, and I know what he's great at. And I delegate to him a bunch of stuff. And when he first, when he first came back to me after seminary, he's like, okay, daddy, he's my marketing director. And he, about, he, he was there for about eight months. He's like, okay, I'm ready now. I, I've got everything. Bring it on, daddy. I said, okay, here comes the dump truck. Beep, beep. And I mean, I just unloaded and he just took it all because that's how he is, right? But yeah. understanding our team works in different ways and you have to know your abilities and what you're great at and stay there and then get people to do the other things. And that's how you yeah. grow a business. I'm interesting because I'm a weird combination of fast start, but like to build systems. So like I'm the kind of person that I will spend 
forever figuring out a problem. And then once I figured out the problem, I no longer care about it. Yes. Um, so like whoever's going to keep the system alive after I have developed it needs to be yeah. someone else. Yes, exactly. <laughs> no, hundred percent. I think it's great. Yeah. <laughs> so like I, I will hardcore fast start. I'm like, I've got a really great idea and build all this through. And then as soon as it's like, okay, that works, then I no longer care. Next. Yep. Let's yeah, go. I, to need to go I need to go on to something else, which is like, so for me, I had to hire an ops person like really fast because I could yeah. get them, get a client started and get them going and get all these things put together and get them through the system. And then like, once they were a client, I was like, I'm sorry, but I solved your problems already. I no longer care, which is, that's right. it's not that I don't care about them or care about their outcomes. It's just that like, I already solved the problem. So it's just not interesting yeah. to me anymore. It no longer gives me energy. So I have to work on something else. And so I have to get someone else who's in who like really likes making sure that all their T's are dotted, you know, the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted, yeah. right? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Praise God. You know, my wife's my bookkeeper, right? And she and my son, who's the chief operating officer, they talk about finances of the business and they'll say, Hey, we're going to invite you to a finance meeting. I'm like, why can I just ask you? Cause I really don't need to, do, I don't want to dive in. They're not, no, we got some high level questions. I'm like, okay, I'll be there for 15 minutes because we know, <laughs> I mean, that drains me. They love it. They know where all the books are and all the envelopes and all. I mean, just make it so. Make it so. Don't... Make it happen. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And let me go do what, I, what I'm really good at. Okay. So let's talk about the flip side then, right? So if your superpower is the one side, the other side of that coin is your fatal flaw, right? And just like every Superman has his kryptonite or Wonder Woman can't remove her bracelets of victory without going mad, you probably have a flaw that held you back in your business, something you struggled with. For me, it was a lot of things. I struggled with perfectionism for a long time that kept me from shipping, right? You know, because I could always tweak a little bit more before I put it into the marketplace. And then you never put anything in the marketplace, which is, well, as you know, it's not, doesn't make for a good business. Or a lack of yeah. self-care, which for me let, meant that I didn't have good boundaries with my clients. I didn't have good boundaries with my time, especially early on in my career. And, but I think more important than what is the flaw is how have you worked to overcome it so that you can continue to grow your business and hopefully sharing your experience. We'll speak a little bit to our audience here. Yeah. So fatal flaw for me, I think was, was not delegating early enough and properly. Okay. So as you mentioned earlier, as entrepreneurs, we wear all the hats, right? And at the very beginning, I mean, I did the whole book from start to finish and all that. And it was, we, we started gaining too many clients and I couldn't do it. And it was like, okay, well, well, how do I do this? How do I delegate properly? Because there is a, there is a good way to do it. Right. And I think my business would probably be twice the size it was, it is today. Had I delegated sooner the right way and let go of things that I'm not great at. So I think I was good at, I'm good at a lot of things, but I'm only great at two or three. And if yeah. I would have learned early on to go, no, no, I'm going to focus where I'm great. I'm going to hire great people. I think we'd be two or three times the size. That's okay. Yeah. But that's what held me back. I think I'm, I'm probably in the same boat, right? I'm really good at a couple of things, yeah. but you know, being entrepreneurs, you tend to get pretty good at a lot of things because you have to. <laughs> Yes. And, and that's, it's, it's a kind of a dangerous, like double-edged sword of being good at things is, and especially early on, because I know for me, the question I always used to ask myself, and this held me back for so long, and I wish more people would learn this sooner. That's why I talk about it all the time on the podcast is I used to ask myself the question when I have something that needed to get done, should I a hire this out to someone else or should I do it myself? And that's a poor person's question. Ask right. me how I know. Right. And the reason, it's a, the reason it's a poor person's question is because the answer was always I should do it myself because it'll yeah. get done faster if I do it myself and it'll be cheaper if I do it myself. And who doesn't want cheaper and faster? Right? Yeah. <laughs> and so I had I had a mentor of mine who gave me a, you know, a mental ass kicking a few years back who was basically like, hey, you're your biggest bottleneck in your business. When you leave here, here's what I want you to do. Go home, hire this person in your business, assign them these roles. And I was yeah. like, I can't do that. How can I afford that? And he was like, you didn't hear me. What I said was, when you leave here, go and hire this person in your business and assign them these roles. And I was like, yeah. and I was going through that whole vacillation process and doing all these things. And he was like, you're not going to get this until you go and hire them and put that on your payroll. Yeah. And I was like, I vacillated on that for like three months. Where I was like, okay, I'll go and do that. Because I did believe him, but I also didn't believe him, if you know what I mean. Uh, oh, yeah. And and three months later, I finally hired that person, put them on payroll, and then it immediately perspective shift of now I've got twice the amount of resources available to bring to bear on the on the the projects that I had in place. And and I was like, because I was going through like, how am I going to afford this? How are we going to get it done? How like all these things like and I realized like, hey, he paid for himself in the first two weeks. 
Yeah. Oh, without question. Without question. Yeah. yeah. It's it's funny. Another my one of my next books has to be now. You know, we've all read and, and heard about good to great. Yeah. Right. I'm gonna write one called Good Not Great. And it's gonna be all around delegation and, and what keeps us, what constrains us as we as entrepreneurs spend too much time doing the good things versus the great things. Because the good will keep us from the great. That's gonna limit your business. Yeah, yeah. And I know for me, as soon as I hired someone, now the question wasn't it wasn't, should I do this myself or should I hire someone? It was, I have this resource on my team. What can I take off of my plate and put onto his? Absolutely. Right? That's a rich person's Absolutely. question. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> right. How do, um, I buy, you know, how do I buy freedom, right? Because everybody says, I got in business for freedom. Really? Is that why you're working 80 hours a week? Mm -hmm. It's about freedom. <laughs> yeah. And man, that the, the other point you make there about good keeping you from the great in for me, it was a lot of just understanding how to make that shift for, I don't even know how to say this, learning where other people, even if they were only doing something at 80% the capacity that I could do it at, I could hire 15 of them. Absolutely. And serve significantly more people. And they can shore up each other's, each other's like problems and stuff like that. And you, you're just so limited when you decide that I have to do everything myself. And yeah. Yeah, I, it took me for way longer than I would like to admit to realize that in right. my business. <laughs> it, it does for most business owners, right? And especially the first go round. If you're a serial entrepreneur or something, you, you figure this out. But if, you, if this is your first go round or second go round, you just learn the hard way. But that's why you were brilliant in putting yourself in that C-suite area to learn from yeah. other people. And that's why I've been in coaching programs and masterminds for years, because I'm always wanting to be in the room of smarter people to learn from them and to learn faster. And, and seriously, books. I mean, I've read most every Dan Kennedy book around, right? Because he's one of my marketing mentors. I've read all kinds of books to put myself in those seats to go, okay, I need to learn something, but I don't want to go to school for it. I got it. Let's go. Yeah, just read a book. Man, books are the greatest thing ever. You can have mentors from everywhere. But yeah, one of my philosophies of business now is that you should only do that which only you can do. And yeah. You should build your team so that they're doing the same thing. They're doing only things that only they can do. And yep. that goes right back to that unique ability and talking about your superpowers and realizing where where is it that you can show up that no one else can show up for you. Right? And I've realized for me, like no one else can be my face and voice. Right? Same thing right. with you and your company. There's a reason right. you get up and show on the up on these podcasts all the time is because no one else can be your face and your voice. Right. And there's probably a lot of other things in your business that you just don't need to do anymore. Right? You can find other people who are better at them. Dude, I laugh all the time because I'll be talking with a client and they're like, hey, can you tell me where my book is in the process? I'm like, nope, I can't. I can get you the I can connect you with Caleb. He can tell you where it is, but I have no idea where your book is because I'm not going to spend my time there, right? My team is taking really good care of you. But to yeah. get a great answer, I'm going to connect you with somebody else because I have no clue because I'm doing something else, right? Yeah, I've I've gotten to that point now too. And like, I just hired an executive assistant. He's fantastic. And yeah. I'm starting to train all of my clients who used to ask me questions. I'm like, listen, you have you have a production manager. They know the answers to the questions. And if you ask me, what's going to happen is I'm going to ask them, and you have direct access to them. Dude, yeah, I don't. I, and I stopped answering those questions and calls, and I just respond with an email and I copy the right person. I say, hey, Richard, you're going to get a much better answer from Sophia. So I'm asking her to answer this, and I, I'm just done. I just start deflecting, man. I'm the what is that Kevlar, right? It, yeah. it, it reflects. Like I built, I helped build this rock star team so that they can serve you better than I ever could. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Cause oh. yeah. Cause I'll give you the wrong answer. And it's like, oh, okay. Yeah, so I just don't answer yeah. questions anymore. So I have, I have a curious sort of add on question and this might actually go into our next question a little bit. And it's about, you know, since we're talking about your team, one of the things that I've noticed is that you have to, you can't just hire people for their ability to show up and be energized by what they do. You also have to hire people for their willingness to show up and be, I'm not sure what the word would be, but to be excited about your mission, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And that they're actually excited to help people accomplish whatever it is that your business helps people accomplish. In your case, it's write books and become experts. How does that play into your team building exercises and what you do to, to find the right people? Yeah. So we run on EOS, right? And part of EOS is creating your core values. And mm -hmm. we always kind of had them, but they made us really work them out. So Kayla and I spent some time. And so as we interview people as in, in onboard team members and communicate, we talk about our core values. We have five of them. And so real quick, joyful excellence, humble confidence, purposeful initiative, bounded flexibility, and never settling. 
and, and we define those and we talk about that, but it's, it's, this is the culture we are building. Do you fit into this? Are you joyfully excellent at what you do? Okay. Are, do you never settle? Are you always looking for the next way to improve, to get better, to serve our clients with excellence? Is that you? And so as we interview, we are weaving in our core values and say, here's what we're doing as a company. I don't want you here to just get a paycheck. We are on mission to do something big and help our clients make a larger impact in the in the worlds they live in. But this is how we function. And if you function like this, you're going to love it here. But if, if you're not aligned with us on a values perspective, you're, you're just going to be a weird cog, right? You're just not going to fit and it's not going to be good for anybody. So we try to share our values and how we operate as a team with people. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. We do the same thing. We have our company values written. We've got four at the moment. I'm working on a fifth one because I think okay. we, we have one more that we want to hit too. And we share all of that in our, what do you call it? Our interview process. And I actually just had one of our, our staff members had one of their, one of their family members became a, a member of our team. And the original staff member came back and they were like, man, your interview process is so cool. I've never worked with a company that like starts with core values. Yeah. But you have to really, in my opinion, because that I'm buying, I'm paying for more than just your talent. I'm really buying you. And if you buy, if you just hire on talent, I think you're going to have a lot of turnover. Yeah. But when, the, when they buy into the culture, they're going to be yeah. around for a long time. We call that the non-tangibles, yeah. right? So the tangible is you get a paycheck at the end of the week, right? That's, yeah. and you know, if we didn't have the tangible, you wouldn't show up, right? So like that's, it's a baseline requirement, but you know who else offers that? Every other company, right? Everybody, Everybody offers that. So if you want to stand apart and attract talent and keep talent and have them show up and be excellent for your clients, you have to have something different, right? You have to have the, the values and you have to have the intangibles. You do. And many times the intangibles actually carry more weight than the tangibles. I've, we've had people come to work for us for less pay than they can get somewhere else, but it's because of the culture that they've experienced with us. And they say, do we, yeah, you guys are different. We've never worked for a company like you. And yeah. they're willing, not, not that I'm cheap, right? But I don't have to pay the top dollar because my culture is so good. People will work for culture, dare I say, more than money. Money's got to be there. You got to have that, right? And you want to yeah, honor yeah. your people and support them well, but they're going to stay for the culture. Yeah. So what I, I've, I've been doing research on this because it's something that like, you know, you get into a new stage of business and you start have to learn new things. So one of the things I've been oh, learning yeah. about is like, how do you actually develop a culture in a company? And yeah. one of the things that I've learned in the hiring process is that today's workers, and this may not have been the case 15 years ago, but it is today. And it's sort of across the board, across generations and whatnot, is people are interested in three things. It's flexibility, impact, finances in that order, right? And where people would think it's finances first, it's not. The finance is third in priority list for most people. And so it's the intangibles, the flexibility and the impact. And that comes from having a mission, knowing what you're doing and why you're doing it and building that culture around things. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it, with it that. Huge difference. Yeah. I have, I want to ask you about your common enemy, right? Every superhero has an arch nemesis, right? It's a thing that they constantly have to fight against in their world. In the world of business, it takes a lot of forms, but generally speaking, we put in the context of your clients. And it's a mindset or a flaw that, that you are constantly have to fight against so that you can actually get them the result that they came to you for in the first place. So what is that common enemy in the book publishing space? Yeah, I would. I, it's, it's funny because I almost changed my answer, but it's limiting beliefs. It's the lack of confidence that a one of my clients has in themselves because they'll say, well, I don't really know if I'm an expert enough. Okay, you've been doing this 15 years serving people, building estate plans for high net worth people. I think you're an expert. Well, I don't know. It's that self-limiting belief because they're looking at all their peers and they're judging themselves there. It's like, no, 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 no. Let me help you understand what you do, which is so wicked cool. And oh, by the way, here's your message. Right? So I think it's that limiting belief in and of themselves to go, I don't have what it takes to become an author. I think that's it. Yeah, yeah, that's a it's an interesting problem because a lot of people struggle with that about whether or not they they what they do has value. Yes. Right. And what's interesting to me is we talk about this a lot. If it comes to easy to you, you don't value it. At 100%. Right? Because we already talked earlier in the in the, in the thing. We value things that we perceive to be difficult. So, yeah. if you do it and it's easy, you don't value it. And but everyone else who's around you watching you do it is going, "Holy cow, I could never do that." 
<laughs> 100%. I don't even, yeah. I don't even know the words that they're using. Yeah. Right? No. All the time. It, but it, it, and it's just like in marketing. You know, we tell people all the time as business owners, you're too close to your company to make good marketing decisions. You don't see your company like your customers see your company. And that's why I've got marketing coaches who look into my company, right? I'm a marketing guy. I just can't see my company in a way that is helpful. So we all have those limiting beliefs. And I think that's one thing that really slows people down. And it really is the arch nemesis of, well, most most business owners. It's hard to get out of that. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's such an interesting problem. I remember like my... My wife and I have had this discussion a lot. She's a incredible cake decorator. Like just, mm. she does really cool things. Like she makes three-dimensional like T-Rexes out of cake. And I'm like, wow. I don't even know. I don't know how you did that. And like, she made one for one of my nephews once and he just like flipped his lid. He was like, it's the coolest thing he's ever seen in his whole life. And it was, it was really awesome. And she used to tell me, she's like, I don't understand why people would pay me to do these things. And I'm like, <laughs> she's like, cause it's so easy. And I'm like, listen, woman. Yeah. I love you a bit, but it is not so easy. <laughs> it's not, seriously. Yeah. That's hilarious. Have you watched yeah. Cake Boss lately? <laughs> yeah, right. And it's it's one of those things that, like we all have that in our lives where we look at the things that we do and we say, no one else would value this because it comes easy to me. Exactly. And that's just not, it's not the way, that's not the way the world works. The, the, the rest of the people around you are looking at what you do and saying, I wish I could do that. Or right. I wish I knew someone how, how to do the things that you're doing. So that's, that's where that, that value comes in. Yeah, it, it really is. And, and all the more reason to put yourself in a, a coaching program, a mastermind group with other people who will be honest with you and say, no, dude, hey, you need to raise your prices because it's valuable. Because I think in our minds, we're like, well, nobody will pay me this because it's not valuable. It's like, no, 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 you can double your prices and you're not going to lose a single client because it's so valuable. That scares the daylights out of people, right? Mm -hmm. But it works. So putting yourself in a mastermind group, a coaching program around people like Richard to go, no, no, no. What you do is amazing. Let me show you the way. And yeah. have the confidence to step on stage, podcasting stage, right? And share what you know. And you're going to attract an audience of hungry people who want to hang around you. Agreed. So now I want to actually get in and talk about your mission that we just we, we alluded to a minute ago. We call this your, your driving force, right? It's the flip side of your common enemy. And, you know, if your your common enemy is what you fight against, your driving force is what you fight for, right? So just like mm. Spider-Man fights to save New York or Batman fights to save Gotham or Google fights to index, in, wow, to index and categorize all the world's information, we yeah. want to know what it is that you fight for with your company, your mission. Yeah. So everything that we do at, at our company level, I mean, comes into and out of Michael, right? Because it's my company. It's my my life. It's it's the driving force. It's the, the second F and my five F. So I've got five Fs that drive my life. Faith, family, finances, fitness, and fun. And all of my life can be fit into those categories, right? And business is obviously in the finance category. From, from a business mission perspective, we're here to help turn experts into authors who use their book to gain clients. It's that simple, right? In, in a variety of different industries, it doesn't matter. But everything that we do at Paperback Expert, really the profits flow into Michael and Jill's bank account at the end of the day. What's this all about? Why are we doing this? And that comes down to what drives me every single day because it, it all ties together. And somebody had challenged me, Richard, a number of years ago to create a six word phrase, going back to brevity, that would just encompass my life. And it took me a while to figure that out. I've got a mission statement that's six or seven words, but it wasn't quite there. And so I finally landed on this. And I'm a follower of Christ. Matthew 25 talks about the parable of the talents, you know, the guy who gets five yeah. and two, yeah. right? And when the master comes back, the, the two guys come to him and say, well, here's, here's what I did. And the master looks at him and says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come into your master's happiness. And I took that. And so here's my six-word phrase. Ready? Live this day for that day. Meaning I the like day that. I stand t d eyeball to eyeball with Jesus Christ. And he's going to say, Michael, here's all the gifts, talents, abilities I've given you. What'd you do with it? Let's look at it. Well done. So Every day, every moment, I'm trying to live my life in a way where Jesus will look at me and go, well done, Michael. Well done. That's what drives me in everything that I do. I love that. It reminds me of one of my, one of my core philosophies it comes from the parable on the mount. 
where, you know, Jesus gets up and he says, you know, he goes through all the parables, essentially, like, you know, give first, and then you shall receive and whatnot. And I always giggle about that because people look at it and they make rather obvious, like connections to the Ten Commandments, right? And the commandments are thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do that, right? It's rules. Yeah. And I always like, that's not what the Sermon on the Mount is, even though the analogies are made there. I always looked at it as like, hey, what people are, what, what Jesus was actually doing on the Sermon on the Mount, he was like, I, I wrote the operating system for the universe, right? I wrote it and I'm just going to give you the cheat codes. Yeah. <laughs> Right, you know, up, down, left, right, right, you know, A, B, right. It's how you get the secret uppercut. And, you know, rule number one is give first, then you shall receive, right? (laughs) And like, I wrote that in, I wrote that into the operating system. And so I was like, if you understand that that's what he's doing there and you realize like, these aren't like rules that he's asking you to follow. It's just like, you know, if you jump out of a building, gravity will make you go down, right? Like that's how it works. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Um, I love that. That That's such a good way to look at it. Now I'm going to have to go back and reread it with that perspective, that vein. That's great. Yeah, I'm not sure why your your mission statement, but anyways, that it just reminded me of that, and that's how I that's how I look at the pair the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. So, but that that is that is I mean the driving force really it it does help me get up out of bed every day and just recalibrate very very quickly to go how am I living right now? And when we're done here, I'm gonna go downstairs and walk in, and my wife and girls are gonna be there. How am I living right there in that moment? Right? How do I, how do I recalibrate? And that phrase just has helped me. It drives what we do in business. As we, as we serve our clients. And I think everybody needs some kind of a phrase, some kind of a recalibration all the time that drives them and says, this is who I am. This is what I'm about at every level. It really does help motivation. I like yours. The one that I have, it's not quite as, I don't know, it's not as, br- as brief as yours and potentially not as powerful. It's something that I've been using for a long time. And it is, I call it the five freedoms. And it's actually, you know, if you've emailed me, you'll notice our email is fivefreedoms.io. And it's actually like the LLC name behind our company. And we talk about the five freedoms are political freedom, financial freedom, time freedom, location freedom, and health freedom. And then we talk about a sixth freedom, but the sixth freedom is spiritual freedom. But, you know, that's a, it's a, it's a whole different discussion. <laughs> but so we talk about, and I, I look at all these things, like everything I do in my business, is this going to, you know, positively impact my freedom in these areas or negatively impact my freedom in these areas. And that's one of the ways that I, I, I look at and judge all the decisions that I'm working through. That's great. That's good. And it, but it's, it's just a framework, right? It's just a, yeah. it's a, it's a, a perspective, a matrix a, a per se. I think people need that because I think a lot of business owners, a lot of people just don't have anything like that. And they're just walking through life and life is brief. And I think I learned that back in 1987 when my dad died. Yeah. yeah. When I promised tomorrow, how am I Fair living not. today? How am I living today? That's oh good. man, yeah, live each day like it's your last. So I got a couple more questions for you. Okay. Number one is your hero's tool belt. And this is the practical portion of our show. And just like every superhero has a tool belt with awesome gadgets, like their batarangs or their web slingers or their laser eyes or their big magical hammers they can spin around and fly with. I'm gonna talk about the top one or maybe two tools that you couldn't live without in your business. Could be anything from your notepad to your calendar to your marketing tools to something you use for your actual product delivery, something you think is essential to getting your job done every day as CEO and founder of a publishing company. Yeah. Two things, really old books. And what I mean by that, not really old, I mean, 30, 40 year old books. So Positioning by Jack Trout now Reese is a classic that I've read. I can't tell you how many times. And instead of reading new books, I go back and I reread old books on my bookshelf because I haven't mined them for all they're worth. So I reread a lot of books, number one. Number two, a discipline that I call thinking time. And I learned this from Keith Cunningham, who wrote the book called The Road Less Stupid. And uh, Keith has <laughs> Keith has lost more millions of dollars richer than you and I will ever see in our life. OK, and he's a great guy. And he has a process of thinking time, getting in a corner. I don't know if you if you can see, but over here in my corner, I've got a, an old rocking chair and it faces the corner of my office. That's my thinking chair. And I'll sit there with a pad of paper and I'll think about one question for about 45 minutes, trying to find the answer to that question. And sometimes it takes me two or three thinking times, but that discipline of thinking about business, challenges, bottlenecks, and finding the solution has transformed our company over the last year or so as I've made the discipline to shut everything out and sit and think about my business. Reminds me of a quote from um, Henry Ford, who said, thinking is the most the the most difficult job anyone does, which is why so few people do it. Uh, <laughs> hey man, Henry, it's so true. It is so true, but it is so powerful. The answers you'll find, if you think for 45 minutes, 
the answers you'll get that are the best happen in minutes 35 to 45. <laughs> it it yeah. takes 25 minutes just to get all the junk out of your head. Then you start thinking. So it, it is a powerful, powerful thing. So yeah, on my Hero, Heroes Tour Belt, old books, thinking time. Give me those and buddy, I can conquer the world. Man, old books is one of those things that I've been... I've got an idea. I run a podcast company, so this is probably not a surprise. I've got an idea for a podcast. <laughs> Shocker. <laughs> and I want to run this podcast. And I haven't figured out exactly how to do this yet. So it's why it's still an idea, not a thing. And maybe I need to sit in a thinking chair and figure this out. But yeah. I want to go through and start talking, finding like experts on all the things that make humans like, well, we're, we're a super species really in, and there's a lot of things that make us that way. Like our ability to sweat is just it's broken, right? Like no other creature does it. And it makes us basically impossible to defeat in any sort of measurable yeah. way. Right. And so like, we have lots of things like that. And one of them, I think is our ability to pass information on in the form of stories. And then mm -hmm. our ability to take that. And we have continued to make our ability to transfer stories to one another better and better and better with technology and books are, they, they change the world. Right. Yeah. And they continue to, to this day, and will continue going on to the future. And I think we're going to come up with even better ways to continue to share stories with people. But man, books are one of those things that like, there's, there's a reason why we conquered this world and we'll probably conquer many others at some point in the future, right? Like, you know, the, the yeah. universe is ours because of things like books, right? Yeah. And to have access to all of the skills and knowledge and you know, wins and losses and failures of another person that is just distilled down into like most important lessons that you can just download oh, yeah. into your brain. Like what? It's, That's crazy. It, it, yeah. No, without question. Because, and I, I love that, that we're different. Humans are different because humans going back to Genesis 1-1, right? We are created in God's image. God is a creator. He's given us that. We are creators. That's why we have books and podcasts and vlogs and VR systems. We are all, always creating, doing those passions back to back to what you said earlier. We don't wait on God. We just do what, what we're passionate about. And in doing that, we create new things for us. And yeah. it's just amazing because we have been created in the image of God who is a creator, who, by the way, spoke everything into existence. So podcasting and creating books by a speak to write process is very godlike, I think. I call that a spark of divinity. Um, there you go. Actually, I actually had a really interesting interview the other day I heard from Elon Musk, where they were asking him about, you know, they're doing all the space exploration stuff with SpaceX. And they were like, do aliens exist? And his response essentially was like, we we haven't seen one iota of anything anywhere that has any indication that there's anything other than human beings in this universe. And we've explored a lot of it with our technology and whatnot. And like, there's just nothing. There's there's nothing that their company is able to see. That's what wow. he said in the interview. And he was like, which means, you know, whether you believe, you know, that God created us, which is what you and I believe, or, you know, he talked about a few other things or whatever, but he's like, reality is we might be the only ones. And if we're the only ones, it's sort of like imperative that we become multi-planetary. You know, so that like when, th you know, the eventuality of like our sun will explode at some point, right? Yeah. <laughs> so if we want to continue this thing called life that we have going on here, <laughs> we have to figure out how to spread it out. Like that's his mission, right? And I just thought it was yeah. really interesting that I was like, it's the kind of thing that makes us unique is that spark of divinity, right? Yeah. That ability to create. And as far as we can tell, we're the only ones in the universe that have it. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that, well, yeah. Isn't that amazing? But yet it's perfect. In yeah. how God's created it. So, yeah, absolutely. Speaking of heroic tools, I want to take a few minutes to tell you about a tool we built that powers the Hero Show and is now this show's primary sponsor. Hey there, fellow podcaster. Having a weekly audio and video show on all the major online networks that builds your brand, creates fame, and drives sales for your business doesn't have to be hard. I know it feels that way because you've tried managing your show internally and realize how resource intensive it can be. You felt the pain of pouring eight to 10 hours of work into just getting one hour of content published and promoted all over the place. You see the drain on your resources, but you do it anyways because you know how powerful it is. Heck, you've probably even tried some of those automated solutions and ended up with stuff that makes your brand look cheesy and cheap. That's not helping grow your business. Don't give up though. The struggle ends now. Introducing Push Button Podcasts, a done-for-you service that will help you get your show out every single week without you lifting a finger after you've pushed that stop record button. We handle everything else, uploading, editing, transcribing, writing, research, graphics, publication, and promotion, all done by real humans who know, understand, and care about your brand 
almost as much as you do. Empowered by our own proprietary technology, our team will let you get back to doing what you love while we handle the rest. Check us out at pushbuttonpodcast.com forward slash hero for 10% off the lifetime of your service with us and see the power of having an audio and video podcast growing and driving micro celebrity status and business in your niche without you having to lift more than a finger to push that stop record button. Again, that's pushbuttonpodcast.com forward slash hero. See you there. And now back to the hero show. So one last question for you, and it's about your guiding principles, right? So one of the things that makes heroes heroic is that they live by a code. For instance, Batman never kills his enemies. He only ever brings them to Arkham Asylum. So as we wrap up the interview, and I talked about the top one, maybe two principles that you live your life by, maybe something you wish you had known when you first started out on your own hero's journey. Yeah. First one that just really hit my mind was be yourself. And, and what I mean by that is for the longest time, Richard, I did not do video in my marketing because I thought I had to look like a certain person that my you know audience wanted to see. I had to speak a certain way. I had to have a better studio and a better microphone. And that kept me from showing up and sharing with the world. And I finally got to the point, I'm not sure what happened, but I finally got to the point where I'm going to show up like Michael. I'm going to do my thing. And if this offends you, go away because this is who I am. And I'm this on podcast, in video, and in sales calls. This is who I am. And it freed me. And what I found, Richard, is people kind of like me. And so they're attracted to me. And I don't have to put on a face to go from here to my house or anything. So be yourself, number one. And I, th I think the corollary there is to tell your story. Everybody has a story to tell that's going to connect at the heart of your audience. Don't hide your story. Share it. And in the professionals that we work with, they don't like to tell their story because that's not professional. I'm like, shut up. Let me tell your story because everybody wants to know anyway. So I think those two guiding principles, be yourself, tell your story, and the rest is really going to take care of itself. Man, there is so much there to unpack. And I just like I want I want to touch on a couple of things. So one of them on the be yourself part. I struggled with that forever. Still do, right? I run a podcast company. I show up on videos all the time. And you can see like I'm even wearing like, you know, this is not my normal uniform. People who watch my podcast all the time know that I have these button up shirts and I, this is my uniform for my podcast. Yeah. Uh, but it's too cold for that. So I'm wearing my jacket and, and showing up as, you know, just showing up as yourself. And one of the things that I realized I had to do and something that I've realized a lot of my clients have to do in order to be comfortable is to know that they will look and sound good enough that their message won't be missed by their market. And Absolutely. so we talk a lot about like, hey, Here's what, an, you know, here's what a good enough camera looks like. Here's what good enough lighting looks like. Here's what a good enough microphone sounds like. And here's what a good enough backdrop looks like. We're not looking for Hollywood. You don't have to be Hollywood. Just make yeah. it something that it's easy for you to show up and have your message not missed by your market, right? That's the first one. And then the second side of what you're talking about is storytelling. And man, you know, we are both in the business of telling stories, you in business and us in podcasting, right? If you go and read my LinkedIn profile, the about section, I talk about human beings being a story born people. And what I mean by that is we know each other and we judge the depth of our relationships based on how much of someone else's story that you know, yeah. right? And if you want proof of that, you can see it in our language, right? And we talked earlier in this podcast about how important language is, right? Language defines everything about how we, how we understand the world. And so if you look at what we call someone who's a stranger, you don't know their name, you don't know their story. An yeah. acquaintance is someone you know their name, but you don't know their story. A friend is someone who you know your name and you know a lot of their story. And a best friend is someone who you know their name and you know so much of their story that when they change up their stories to, you know, to, to emphasize different details, you notice, right? And the only way that you get to know them better is you either go out and create new stories together or go out and have new experiences and share them with each other, right? And so we judge the depth of our relationships based on how much of someone else's story that we know. So yeah. to your point, if you want to have more success in the marketplace, the market needs to know more of your story. Well, there's a book right there, dude. I love the way you just did that because I'm going to remember that and share that with other people, but that is so very true. I love it. That's <laughs> awesome. Good. Well, thank you. It is well, you're welcome. Now, I've never heard anybody do it quite that way, but I'm like, 
oh no, that's exactly, those were the right words and the right frameworks. And it's like, no, that's exactly where it is. It reminds me of, you probably read it, Seven Habits, Stephen Covey, Seven Habits. Oh yeah, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, yeah. And and I think I was listening to the audiobook or something years ago, but he was talking about the subway. He and his kids were on, or he's on the subway and this guy gets on the subway and he's got kids, right? And Stephen's riding and these kids are just running back and forth, causing havoc, doing all kinds of stuff. And the dad's just sitting there doing nothing. And Stephen's sitting over here going, dude, what? I mean, and so finally, after you know three or four stops, Stephen gets up the nerve to go talk to the guy and says, hey, sir, I'm, could you like take care of your kids? Could you handle them, please? Because they're really making a mess. And the guy looks up and says, oh, yeah, sorry. We just came from the hospital. Their mother just died. We don't know what to do. And Stephen said, in that moment, everything changed. I went to empathy and right because he got the man's story. Before that, the guy was an idiot, jerk, hut dad. Now he was a husband who was in pain and need and the kids were stories change how we're perceived in business. Tell your story and it's going to be so much better. Yeah. Yeah. And man, if it, today you have more opportunities and more modalities to tell your story than ever, right? It could be yeah. a book, could be a podcast, your social media feed, you know, your stage speaking opportunities. Like if you have opportunities to share your story with your marketplace, that is how you create leads and sales today. You don't really have an option. So that's right. Yeah. And that's what's going to draw people to you. They don't care about your product or your service because they can get that anywhere. Yep. They, they want to know you. No like and trust. Going back to what you said earlier. That's yeah, how we yeah. tell it. And that's where you get right into things like, man, the world's changing with AI right now. More and more and more of the actual work product is going to be commoditized. And as more work product becomes commoditized, your story is going to become more and more important. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, well, that I think is a great place to wrap our interview. I do finish every interview with a simple challenge I call the Heroes Challenge. And I do this to help get access to stories that we might not otherwise find on our own. So the question is simple. You know, do you have someone in your life, in your network that you think has a cool entrepreneurial story? Who are they? First names are fine. And why do you think they should come share their story with us here on The Hero Show? Yeah, I think Tom Ruich is one of my, my good friends. He, he runs a, um, a couple companies and he talks a lot about story. In fact, his company, you'll love him, Story Power Marketing, but he uses some characters and some cartoons. He understands the power of story, but he used to run a, an email marketing service years and years ago and, and sold it. And then he pivoted to help business owners understand how to tell stories and things. And he can help you weave your story in a way that is very unique, very powerful and connect it with what you do and how you serve your clientele. I think Tom would be an amazing guest. He's a dear friend of mine and we stay in, in contact a lot. Awesome. Well, let's see if we can reach out to Tom and, and get him on the show afterwards, get an introduction or something. They don't always see us, but when they do, we always get you know cool stories that we might otherwise find because not everyone does the podcast rounds like you and I might do. That's so right. that's right. You know, in comic books, there's always the crowd of people at the end who are cheering and clapping for their acts of heroism. So what I want to do as we close is our analogous to that is where can people find you if they want your help in the future? Where can they light up the bat signal and say, hey, Michael, I think I need a book in my business. But I think more importantly than where is who are the right types of people to actually reach out and light up that bat signal and ask for your help? Yeah, business, uh, really experts in business. If you've been in business, any it doesn't matter, three years or more, and you have a great product or service, but you're struggling to really get your message out and connect with your audience. Let's at least have a conversation because you have a book inside of you. Let us find that message. Let us tell your story and teach you how to use your book to grow your business. Easiest place to find me is paperbackexpert.com. Absolutely. Michael, thank you so much for coming on our show today and sharing a little bit of your story so people can get to know what you do and how you do it. Really appreciate that. Do you have any final words of wisdom for our audience before we hit the stop record button? You know, we took it earlier. Is Seriously, be yourself. Show up authentically. Tell people your story and get some of theirs and you're going to have a great life and a superb business. Awesome. Thank you very much, Michael. Thanks, Richard. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of The Hero Show, where we work to shift the cultural narrative around entrepreneurship and celebrate the heropreneurs who make our world a better place. Don't forget to visit our website at theheroshow.tv, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or via RSS, so you'll never miss an episode. If you found value in our show, we'd truly appreciate a rating on iTunes, or better yet, Share it with a friend to help us spread the message of entrepreneurship as a force for good. Curious to learn more about the stories and insights of these incredible heropreneurs? 
Check out our in-depth interviews and resources on our website. Together, let's support and inspire the next generation of entrepreneurs as they embark on their own heroic journeys. Join us again next week for another episode of The Hero Show, where we'll continue to explore the world of heropreneurs, their superpowers, and the positive impact they bring to our lives. Until then, stay heroic.